Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 30 of Surah At-Tawbah, he says, the Jews say that Ezra is the son of God. And the Christians say that the Messiah is the son of God. These are words from their mouths. They resemble the words of those who disbelieved before. God curse them, how they are perverted. In our last session, my dear brothers and sisters, we spoke about the concept of jizya. And this is a, a special indemnity that is afforded to Ahlul Kitab, who are conquered by Muslims, who are, who are combatant towards the Muslim community. They're given the option of retaining their religious identity, given that they pay a jizya, known as an indemnity. And we spoke in detail about that. In ayah number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then speaks about some of the erroneous beliefs of the Jews and the Christians and what, what, it, what actually caused the corruption of their faith. So the ayah begins by saying, وَقَالِتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرُ نُبْنُ اللَّهِ The Jews say that Ezra is the son of God. There is an interesting hadith reported by Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam and this hadith is found in a tafsir of the Qur'an that is attributed to Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. There is a tafsir known as tafsir al-Imam al-Askari where it's a collection of some of the explanatory statements of the Imam where he sheds light on various verses of the Holy Quran. Now there's a dispute and a discussion among the ulama regarding the authenticity of this book. But any in any case, in this tafsir that is attributed to Imam al-Askari, there's a hadith from the sixth Imam. And Imam al-Sadiq salam in commenting on this verse, he says, لَقَدْ حَدَّثَنِي أَبِيَ الْبَاقِرِ Imam al-Sadiq says, my father, Imam al-Baqir, informed me. So here the Imam is going to give us the senad, the chain of transmission for this hadith. And it seems that Imam al-Sadiq is perhaps speaking to some people who may not see him as a divinely appointed representative of God. And therefore you find that the Imam is mentioning that this is a hadith from my forefathers because we know that there are some Muslims who don't believe in the Imam, some, uh, some who don't believe in the Imam of Imam al-Sadiq, others who don't believe in the Imam of, the, the imam of imam al-Baqir. So the Imam says, حدثني أبي al-Baqir, my father Imam al-Baqir informed me. عن جدي علي بن الحسين, my father reports from my grandfather, Imam Zain al-Abidin. عن أبيه الحسين سيد الشهداء. Imam Zain al-Abidin transmits this hadith from Imam al-Husayn. And Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam reports the hadith from his father, Amir al-Mu'minin. عن أمير المؤمنين أنه اجتمع يوما عند رسول الله أهل خمسة أديان. Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, he says there were five groups of people from five different religious traditions who came to Medina and met the Holy Prophet. And these five groups are Al Yahud. There was a, a group of Christian, a group of Jews who came to meet the Prophet. When Nasara, a group of Christians came to meet the Prophet. Waddahriya. Addahriya are materialists who believe that the universe is eternal, that it had no beginning. Wathanawiya, the dualists who believe that the universe is controlled by the force of light and the force of darkness. Wa mushrikul Arab and the polytheists among the Arabs. So these five different groups, they sent delegations to meet with the Prophet. 
to discuss certain theological matters. They came for a religious debate. It's a very lengthy hadith, but I want to share with you the excerpt from the Jews, the discussion that the Jews had with the Holy Prophet. So this group of Jews, they tell the Prophet, Rasulullah asks them, you know, what are what do you believe? They said to the Prophet that we believe that Ezra, Uzair, is the son of God. These, this is one of the things that they share with the Prophet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells them that do you expect me to believe in something? without you providing evidence. So Rasulullah says, what's your dalil? What's your burhan? You're claiming that Uzair is the son of God. And it seems, my dear brothers and sisters, that, that it was a small group of Jews during the time of the Prophet who had this belief. Meaning not all Jews believed that Ezra was the son of God, but a, a faction of Bani Israel had this belief, had this aqidah. So the Prophet asked them, what's your burhan? What's your evidence that Ezra is the son of God? They say to the Prophet, لِأَنَّهُ أَحْيَا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ التَّوْرَى بَعْدَمَا ذَهَبَتْ They say because this Ezra, he revived the Torah in the hearts of Bani Israel, meaning he restored adherence to the Torah. Bani Israel had drifted away from the teachings of the Torah and he initiated a revival, a return to the religious text. And the, the only reason that he did this is because he is the son of God. So the Prophet he listens carefully to their evidence. And the Prophet says to them, So the Prophet says that, how is it that Uzair is the son of God and Musa is not? If Uzair is the son of God in your eyes, because he returned and he restored the adherence to the Torah, how about Musa? That if you're going to claim that Uzair is the son of God because he revived the Torah in the hearts of Bani Israel, Musa brought the Torah. So based on your logic, Musa is more deserving to be the son of God. And in addition, to bringing the Torah to you, you he performed many astonishing miracles that you are all familiar with. So the Holy Prophet, he gets into this discussion with them and they're not able to reply. Now what's interesting, brothers and sisters, is that if you look among the Jewish community today, I don't think that there are any Jews today who believe that Uzair is the son of God. I'm not sure, but I don't, I don't think that any Jew today harbors this belief. And it's, in, it's interesting, brothers and sisters, that even if an erroneous belief is not adopted by the entire religious community, you find that Rasulullah makes it a point to, to address it. That it doesn't need to be something that's widespread. So Rasulullah, it's as though this was a new belief that had developed among a small group of Bani Israel and he addresses it and he dispels this misconception. And it could be possible that the only reason why this belief doesn't exist today is because of the debates that the Prophet had with Bani Israel at his time. So the ayah says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرُ بْنُ اللَّهِ The Jews claimed that Uzair is the son of God. And it's interesting that Uzair never claimed to be the son of God. And this seems to be the case with many of these holy personalities. They don't claim 
to be divine, but rather people who come after them, they attribute divinity to them. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرُ بْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَى الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ اللَّهِ The Christians say that Jesus, that the Messiah is the Son of God. Now with Uzair, this belief was only held by a small group of Jews during the time of the Prophet. But the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, this is not held by a minority of Christians, but rather this is the predominant view in the Christian tradition. Now, historically, brothers and sisters, Isa السلام, never claimed to be God or the Son of God. In fact, none of his disciples ever made such a claim. This belief that Jesus is the Son of God was decisively sanctioned in the year 325 after AD. 325 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine, he called upon the clergymen and the leaders within the Christian community from the eastern part of the empire to the western part they all came together at a meeting called the council of nicaea in this meeting there were many issues that were discussed among the topics that were discussed was the reality of jesus christ specifically his divinity because the roman emperor constantine understood that the best way to control an empire is to unite them in their belief system. People across the Roman Empire, they had different beliefs regarding the reality of Jesus Christ in relation to God. So therefore, they came to a decision that Jesus is actually God in the flesh. He's the Son of God. So you find that this idea of Jesus being divine was actually cemented as official Christian, Christian doctrine at the Council of Nicaea. This is about three centuries after Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at the, the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament, you'll find that there are actually many prophets who are given the honorific title of being the Son of God. You know, brothers and sisters, the Injil obviously was not revealed in the English language. The Injil was revealed in the language of Isa السلام, Aramaic, which is close to Hebrew. And when it was translated, it seems that this title the son of god which in aramaic means the chosen one of god because it's a title that has been applied to many different prophets as you, as we see in the old testament but over time this son of god was taken in a literal sense now the romans historically they were they were a polytheistic society and they they had this belief they believed in multiple gods and this is why you know in december on december 25th the polytheists they used to celebrate the birth of the sun god so you see that there is polytheistic influence on the christian tradition there's a merging of some of the beliefs of the polytheistic tradition of the Romans and Christianity. So there's a, a, a blending of a lot of these ideas. And then you see that the teachings of Isa ibn Maryam السلام, were eventually corrupted. Now, what's interesting, my dear brothers and sisters, is that when you look at the Quran, the Holy Prophet had numerous encounters with 
priests and and monks and they would often argue with the prophet saying that especially the uh the christians of najran when they came to the prophet in the ninth year after the hijrah they came to debate about the position of jesus and their argument was that jesus is the son of god primarily because he was born without a father and this is where you find that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he responds to this argument in surah ali imran ayah number 59 so one of the main arguments in addition to the fact that he performed many miracles they argue that this man was born miraculously without a father he has a mother but he doesn't have a father and therefore because he doesn't have a human father his father must be god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the prophet in his discussion with the christians of najran inna mathala isa inda allah kamathali adam khalaqahu min turabin thumma qala lahu kun fayakun the quran is very logical Allah says the example of Jesus with God is like the example of Adam. They are both created from this earthly material. They're created from soil, from the elements of the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam without a mother or a father the command kun fayakun isa السلام, at least had a mother so if the if the argument here is that jesus is the son of god because he doesn't have a human father then adam السلام, is even more deserving because he doesn't have a mother or a father allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he also says in Surah Maryam, Surah 19, ayah number 30. You know what's what's you know the personality of Isa alayhi salam, especially when you look at the world today and what people do in his name, it's really the irony of ironies. So this man, there are almost two billion people around the world that believe this man is the son of God. And the irony is that in ayah number 30 of Surah Maryam is that Allah tells us that the first words that Isa alayhi salam uttered was what? Inni Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiya. The first word of Isa alayhi salam in a public setting was what? I am the servant of God. Isn't it ironic that the man whose first words to Bani Israel in a public forum was, I am the slave of God. This same man, people say he's the son of God. Secondly, Isa alayhi salam, he's known for his zuhd, for his detachment and indifference to the material world. And this man's birth has become the symbol of indulgence and the symbol of capitalism. You see how shaitan has twisted and distorted what Isa alayhi salam has brought to the world. His first word was inni Abdullah. Shaitan whispers into the hearts of the people, causes them to deviate, and they say he's the son of God. Isa alayhi salam was far away from dunya. He was not attached at all to this worldly life. And his birth becomes the icon, the icon of capitalism and materialism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah in Surah An Nisa, verse 172, you know, because you know, many times when you say to Christians that Jesus was a human being, he was a servant of God. Some of them, they take offense to this. 
as though being called Abdullah is demeaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 172. Allah says, Allah says, Isa is never and will be never ashamed of being the slave of God. This is an honor for Isa. It was his first words. His entire life was a life of servitude to God. Allah says, Isa is not ashamed to be called the servant of God, nor are the angels who are close to God. Jibra'il is not, does not find it beneath himself to be called Abdullah. Mika'il, Israel, Malaikatul Muqarrabun, they are all honored to be called the servants of God. And Isa السلام, is also honored. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in the Quran, He tells us Mal Masih in, in, uh, in Surah Al Ma'idah, Surah number five, ayah number 75. There are many beautiful ayat about Isa alayhi salam in the Quran. Allah says, Mal Masih ibn Maryam illa rasulun qad khalat min qablih al rusul. Allah says, The Messiah, the son of Mary. Isa is nothing more than a messenger. The messengers before him have perished. God is necessarily eternal. That's why in the Quran we say, He is the all living who does not die. Now the Christians believe that he was crucified and he died. What kind of God dies? Allah is the living who does not die. So Allah says that Isa is the messenger and the messengers before him perished, meaning that he will, he will die one day. Isa is not going to live forever. He will perish, he will die, just as all of these prophets and messengers have passed away. And then Allah says, Wa ummuhu siddiqa, And his mother is an extremely truthful woman. Siddiqa. And then what does Allah say? He refutes the argument that they are divine, that they are this, that Jesus is the Son of God or God by saying what? Kana yakulan ta'am. Maryam and Isa used to eat food. Now, why does Allah say this? There are those within the within Christianity who believe that Jesus is God. And there are many, there are some denominations within Christianity that also attribute divinity to Maryam. I've been to Central America and I've met many Christians who believe that Mary is divine, that she's not, she's not fully human, she's divine. What does Allah, in one word, in one word, he shatters this argument. He says they used to eat food. Allah argues that they are not divine because they eat food. Does God need nourishment? Allah doesn't need nourishment. In fact, in dua, what do we say? The fact that Jesus ate means what? He was in need. Isa السلام, drank water, he ate. Why did he drink water? Why did he eat? Because he needed food. If you have a need for nourishment, how can you be God? How are you all powerful? Furthermore, in dua, there are many duas where we address Allah and we say, Allah, alhamdulillah, alladhi yut'imu wa la yut'am. Praise be to God. The one who feeds but is not fed. Allah is the razak. He nourishes. He nurtures. Allah doesn't need to be nourished. Allah doesn't need to be fed. So within all of these verses, there are explicit and implicit arguments against the divinity of Jesus Christ and his mother.
there is an interesting debate. For those of you who have time, I urge you to read some of the debates of Imam al-Ridha salam with the Christians. Some of them can be found in Kitab al-Ihtijaj by Shaykh al-Tabrasi. There's a, there was a conversation between Imam al-Ridha salam and some of the priests and the monks. And they were arguing about whether or not Jesus is God or the Son of God or a messenger of God. So Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, he makes a very beautiful comment. He says to them that Isa alayhi salam was a great man. However, he was lacking in ibadah. Now Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, when he says that Isa was lacking in worship, he meant in relation to the Prophet, that his ibadah is, is at a lower level than the ibadah of Rasulullah for example. So he mentions that he could have worshipped more, that he was lacking in the world, in the realm of ibadah, of worship. So the, the priests and the monks said, what are you talking about? How, how could you say such a thing about Jesus? There is no one who surpassed him in worship. This is what they told to Imam al-Ridha. Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha alayhi salam, he says to them, very simply, who was he worshipping? If he's God, was he worshipping himself? And they didn't have an answer. You know, sometimes, brothers and sisters, the arguments are so simple. If we take a moment and we reflect, it's very clear that this man is one of the greatest messengers of God, but he's not divine. He's not God himself. One more ayah and inshallah we'll move on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about a conversation that will take place on the day of judgment with Isa. So there's a conversation between God and Isa alayhi salam. Because after all, million, billions of people throughout history have believed that Isa alayhi salam is God or the son of God. So on the day of judgment, there are so many people that have this erroneous belief because of Isa alayhi salam. So there is now a conversation between Allah and Isa. In ayah number 116 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى ابْنِ مَرْيَمِ Allah says, O oh Jesus, the son of Mary, all of us are going to hear this exchange on the day of judgment. وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى ابْنِ مَرْيَمِ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمْنِي إِلَهَيْنِ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Allah will ask, and of course Allah is all-knowing, but He wants, He wants it to be known. Allah asks Isa, did you say to people that me and my mother are gods other than God? That we are gods? Isa alayhi salam, he says in the ayah, Qala subhanak, glory be to you. You are far above that. Ma yakunu li an aqula ma laysa li biha. How can I say something that I have no right to say? I have no right to make such a claim. In kuntu qultuhu faqad alimta. Oh my Lord, if I had said such a thing, you would have known it. But I'm innocent. I never claimed to be your son, nor did I claim divinity. So Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment sets the record straight for everyone that this man who has been worshipped by other people, Allah says, from him you will hear that he is my abd, that he will deny ever making such a statement. So if we go back to the verse, قالت, وقالت اليهود عزير ابن الله وقالت النصارى المسيح ابن الله ذلك قولهم بأفواههم Allah says, those are words from their mouths, meaning they have no reality. You can say that he is the son of God until Yom al -Qiyam. It has no reality. It's just words. Nothing more than 
words, sounds that are coming out of your mouth. Allah says, يُضَاهِئُونَ قَوْلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ those are words from their mouths. They resemble the words of those who disbelieved before. It seems from this ayah that attributing divinity to human beings is not a new phenomenon. It existed during the time of the Prophet. It existed during the time of Isa, during the time of Uzair, and even before that. In fact, if you go back to the history of the early prophets, polytheism and idol worship appeared. So you have Adam, people were monotheists, Adam and his children. And then you have Idris who comes after him. Of course, there are some prophets in between, but Idris is the next major one. And then you have Nuh. During the time of Nuh, you see, idol worship became, became common practice. People started to attribute divinity to human beings. If you go to Surah Nuh, verse 23, the community of Nuh, because he's trying to revive Tawheed now, the Tawheed that was taught by Adam and Idris, وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ do not abandon your gods. They're threatened by the message of Nuh. وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثًا وَيَعُوقًا وَنَسْرًا Do not abandon your gods. Do not abandon wadda. So these are names. wadda. وَلَا سُوَاعًا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثًا يَغُوثًا is the third. وَيَعُوقًا وَنَسْرًا Five names of idols that they were worshiping. These idols were the images of five righteous men. After they died, they were mu'mineen, righteous men, salihin, awliyaullah. After they died, people, shaitan whispered into the hearts of people. Some say that shaitan actually created these idols, but in any case, there were images that were built, statues, to keep the memory of these righteous men alive. And then during the winter time, Shaytan whispered into the hearts of this, these people. In the beginning, they knew that these are servants of God. We have built these statues just to keep their legacy alive. During the winter time, Shaytan whispers into their heart, bring the statues inside of your homes so they are not destroyed by the elements. They move them into their homes. And now the statue, statues are in the homes of the people. So one generation goes by and they venerate them, but they don't worship them. And then the next generation, the waswasa of shaitan, gradually they start to worship these idols as gods. So this idea of attributing divinity to human beings, it goes back to the time of Noor. It's not a new phenomenon. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He interjects. Allah says, Qatalahumullah. Qatalahumullah literally means God fight them. Now, here, Qatalahumullah, what is meant is that may God curse them. The Arabs, when they would say, Allah, it's a way of, it's another way of saying la'na. There's a hadith from Amir al muminin where he comments on this phrase, Allah. The Imam says the meaning of it is Allah. May God deprive them of his mercy. When you associate partners with God, you deprive yourself of his mercy. If I tell you now that if you go to person A, Person A will give you whatever you want because he's so generous. If you don't go to person A and you go to someone else, you are depriving yourself of the generosity of person A because you went to someone who doesn't have the capacity to give you as person A would give you. 
So when Allah says قاتلهم الله, it means God curses them, meaning that they are deprived of Allah's rahmah because they're turning towards beings who don't have the power to help them or benefit them in any way. And Amir al muminin when he says that قَاتَلُهُمُ Allah means لَعَنَهُمُ Allah, فَسَمَّ اللَّعْنَةَ قِتَالًا that Allah, that God fight them, means God curse them. And then Imam Amir al muminin quotes Surah Abbas, Surah 80, 170, where Allah says, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ meaning لُعِنَ الْإِنسَانُ that man is cursed because of his disbelief, Lu'ina. Now, we go to ayah number 31. Allah says, اتخذوا أحبارهم وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَالْمَسِيحَ ابْنَ مَرْيَمْ وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ لِيَعْبُدُوا إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا لَا إِلَاهَ إِلَّا هُوَ Subhanahu Amma Yushrikun. They have taken, meaning the Jews and the Christians. So now Allah is speaking about some of the, the causes for their deviation. What made Bani Israel deviate? What caused all of these distortions in Christianity? Allah says they have taken their rabbis and monks as lords apart from God, as well as the Messiah, son of Mary, in Isa. Though they were only commanded to worship one God, there is no God but He, glory be to Him, above the partners they ascribe. Now, when you read this verse, what may be puzzling to you is that we know that the Jews don't take their rabbis as lords. I've never met any Jew that says, my Lord is this rabbi. If you meet a Christian, there's no Christian that's gonna say that my Lord is the priest or the monk. But here Allah says, he says, he mentions that the reason why these people deviated is because they have taken their rabbis and monks as lords apart from God. And some of the companions of the Prophet, some of the companions of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they ask the Imams this. They say, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, the Jews don't worship the rabbis. The Christians don't worship the monks. They don't take them as lords and gods. So what is this ayah talking about? Abu Basir, who is one of the students of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq. He says that I asked Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam about this ayah. What is the meaning that the Jews and the Christians, they took their rabbis and monks as lords apart from God? The Imam alayhi salam, he says, مَا دَعَوْهُمْ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ دَعَوْهُمْ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ وَلَوْ دَعَوْهُمْ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ أَنفُسِهِمْ مَا أَجَابُهُمْ The Imam alayhi salam, he says the rabbis and the monks, the religious clergy in Christianity and Judaism, the scholars, the ulama, they didn't ask people to worship them. If they had done so, no one would have listened to them. وَلَكِنَّهُمْ أَحَلُّوا لَهُمْ حَرَامًا وَحَرَّمُوا عَلَيْهِمْ حَلَالًا فَكَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ The Imam says, what the Jews and the Christians did, what these rabbis and monks did, they didn't ask people to worship them. They didn't claim to be gods, but rather they made the scholars of Christianity, the scholars of Judaism, they made permit, they made forbidden what God made permissible. 
and they forbade what God made permissible. And they made permissible what God had forbade. Meaning, what was halal, they made it haram. And what was haram, they made it halal. They started to assume the role of lawgiver. They changed the ahkam. So the Imam says, in this way, people began worshipping them, meaning they started to take their deen from them without realizing it. So Allah has an order, a command, and they change the commandments of God. Meaning, they are changing and they are distorting the Sharia. Imam al-Sadiq in another hadith, he says, ma samu lahum wa la salu. The Imam says, I swear by God, the Jews and the Christians, they didn't fast for their rabbis or their priests, nor did they pray to them. This is not the type of lordship that, that, I'm, that the ayah is talking about. وَلَكِنْ أَحَلُّوا لَهُمْ حَرَامًا وَحَرَّمُوا عَلَيْهِمْ حَلَانًا Rather, they made permissible what God made forbidden, and they made forbidden, they forbade what God made permissible. فَتَّبَعُونَ So they obeyed these corrupt religious leaders instead of God. وَعَبَدُوهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَشْعُونَ And they worshipped them. They surrendered to them instead of surrendering to God. My dear brothers and sisters, this ayah is highlighting a very important concept. And that is the people who change and corrupt and distort religion are not the commoners. Do you think it's the guy who's selling vegetables in the market? He's doing tahrif of Allah's religion? that he's distorting, that he's corrupting. It's the ulama, it's the rabbis, the scholars, the monks, the priests. This is why Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam if you look at their followers, the imams alayhim salam they have certain people who love them. They are muhibbin. They love the Ahlul Bayt, but they don't believe in their imam. So this is, if you think about it as like a circle, the imam is in the middle and he has different layers of companions and acquaintances. The outer circle are the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, the muhibbin. The imams are virtuous. They have these noble qualities. The people love them. Ahlul Sunnah, for example, they love the Ahlul Bayt. And then you have the closer circle, which is the Shia, the, theologically the Shia, those who believe that Imam al-Baqir, that Imam al-Kadhim, that they are, we don't only love them, not only are they virtuous, but they are appointed by God and obedience to them is mandatory. They are divinely appointed. And then an even closer circle, you have the elite from among the Shias, you have people like Zurara, like Muhammad ibn Muslim, like Abban ibn Taghlan, people who the Imams trained, who were direct students of the Imam, who are the scholars among the Shia and the Imams, alayhim salam, they spent the majority of their time developing these individuals. Because Ahlul Bayt, they know that it was the corrupt rabbis, the corrupt monks, the corrupt priests who distorted the teachings of the prophets of the past. That in order to preserve the authentic, the pure Islam, we have to teach these people, we have to give them knowledge, and we also have to develop their taqwa. That's why the Imams, السلام, they didn't just impart knowledge to these people. They taught them the art of tazkiyatun nafs. And this is why 
Ahlul Bayt السلام, they don't just tell us to take our knowledge from anyone. Being knowledgeable is not sufficient to be followed. And this is where people of previous religions, this is where they made the mistake. They see, they meet a rabbi or a monk and they're knowledgeable, but they don't pay attention to the akhlaq, to the taqwa, the piety. They just refer to a religious specialist who has knowledge. Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, in a hadith that many of us are familiar with, the Imam is preparing, he's the 11th Imam, he's preparing the Shia for the ghaybah. When we will not have direct access to the Imam, the Imam says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ صَائِنًا لِنَفْسِهِ حَافِظًا لِدِينِهِ مُخَالِفًا لِهَوَى مُطِيعًا لِأَمْرِ مَوْلَى فَلِلْعَوَامِ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوا The Imam says, as for, as, the Imam says, فَأَمَّا مِنَ الْفُقَهَاء As for the scholars, the fuqaha, and fuqaha here doesn't mean that someone who is only specialized in fiqh. Fuqaha here, it means someone who has a deep understanding of religious matters, who has a deep understanding of Islam. And the, the Imam says, he gives us the qualities of the scholars that we should follow. They're very protective of their souls. They don't take chances. They're very, they, they do a lot of ihtiyat when it comes to their souls. They safeguard their religion. Their religiosity is so precious to them in the same way that when you have a gem or a diamond or something that's very valuable, you're very protective of it. You don't put it in a place that it can be, be stolen. You don't put it in a place where it can get scratched up or tarnished. Imam says, follow scholars who treat their hearts this way, that they safeguard their deen. And they don't put themselves in places and environments that may jeopardize their religion. Mukhalifan li hawa. Don't only follow scholars who have knowledge, follow a scholar who goes against his desires. Just because something is halal doesn't mean that you should do it. Our maraja, may Allah lengthen their lives. When you go and visit them, and you know, we live in a time where there are many people who are claiming to be ayatollahs and marajah, but when you meet them, the true ones you'll know. Which one which ones among them have zuhd? You know, Ayatollah Sistani, for example, when you go and you go into his house, the the saya, the, the abaya that he has, believe me, it's 30, 40 years old. He was even telling some of the students that. He only he has very simple quality clothes, and if you look at the Pope, maybe his outfit costs one hundred thousand dollars. Mukhalif al lihawa, they go against when they are confronted with a decision. They ask themselves, which path is my nafs more inclined to, and they go against it. Mukhalif al lihawa. They're very tough on, their, on themselves. They resist their desires. Even their halal desires, they curb them. They don't overindulge. They're obedient to Allah. Imam al Askri says, these are the scholars that you follow. People who have knowledge and they have these qualities. They're protective of their souls. They safeguard their religion. They go against, they resist their lowly desires. And then the Imam says, usually people, they stop here. They, they don't finish the hadith. The Imam says, وَذَلِكَ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا بَعْضَ فُقَهَاءِ الشِّيْعَ لَا كُلَّهُمْ Imam al-Askari says, and this applies to some of the Shia scholars, not all of them. Unfortunately, some of us were naive. 
Just because someone is wearing a imama and he has a nice white beard and he says that he's Ayatollah, you believe it right away? Imam al Askari says that, that some of the fuqaha among the Shia have these qualities, not all of them. And you have to follow these individuals who have the combination of ilm and taqwa. Don't be like the Nasara, the Christians and the Jews who just followed those who had knowledge but didn't take into consideration the element of taqwa. It's the lack of taqwa of these monks and these priests and these rabbis. It's their lack of taqwa that is the reason why the Injeed has been distorted and the Torah has been distorted. And then Allah says, يُرِيدُونَ أَن يُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَيَأْبَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أَن يُتِمَّ نُورَهُ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ Allah says, they desire to extinguish the light of God with their mouths. But God refuses to do nothing but complete His light. Though the disbelievers dislike it. Not only is the religion of Allah opposed, but there are those who are actively trying to obliterate it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this ayah, He doesn't just say that I'm going to protect my light. You know, sometimes someone is trying to blow out a candle and you're just blocking their breath. You're just keeping the candle lit. You're protecting the light. Allah doesn't say that I am going to only protect my light. What does he say? I am going to complete it. I'm going to increase it. I'm going to complete it. Which means... There is something that has not been completed yet. This ayah is speaking about Nurullah, the light of God. If you go to Surah An Nur, Surah 24, ayah number 35, the famous ayah, Allahu Nur Samawati Wal Arf, Allah gives a very beautiful parable. And Allah gives a description of this light. And this is the light of guidance. When Allah says that He's Nur, meaning that He is the guide of the heavens and the earth. Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard, Imam Al Ridha explains this is not physical light. God is not made of photons. But it's a metaphor, meaning that God is the one who guides everything in the heavens and the earth. Now, after you read ayah number 35, the natural question that you ask is, where is Nurullah? Where is this light of God? Allah, in the next ayah, he answers. Ayah number 36. This is, not, this is not something that's theoretical or abstract. Allah says, this nur is found in homes that Allah has permitted to be elevated. فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعْ وَيُذْكَرَ فِي أَسْمُ يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِ وَالْآصَالِ The Prophet was asked, Ya Rasulullah, what houses are these? What are these houses? Rasulullah says, بُيُوتُ الْأَنْبِيَاء They are the houses, they are the homes of Prophets. Abu Bakr asks the Prophet, he points at the house of Ali and Fatima, and he asks, minha? Is this house, the house of Ali and Fatima, included among those homes where we find Nurullah? The Prophet, وآله, what does he say? Bal huwa min afadiliha. Rather, the, the Prophet says, not only is it among them, it is the best of the homes. And then Allah says in ayah number 33, and we'll conclude shortly, 
هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون It seems that I'm not going to have enough time to go into detail on this verse. There's a lot to discuss. So ayah number 32, Allah says that you will complete this light. That there are those who are trying to extinguish Nurullah. Allah promises that he's not only going to protect it, but he's going to complete it. Which means it's incomplete. Something has to happen for this nur to be completed. And then Allah gives us the answer as to how he's going to complete this nur. In ayah number 33 where he says, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a prophecy as to how Islam will prevail over all religions. Inshallah, we'll leave this discussion for next week. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Uh, we discussed about how um, the Jews those days took uh, Uzair as their uh, as the son of God and uh, Jesus Christ as the son of God. And what do you have to say about uh, Nusairis and Malangis in uh, our Shia faith? Can, can, well, I didn't get the last part of the question. Can you hear me, Sheikh? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, Sheikh, just now we discussed about uh, the Yahudis, the Jews. Um, in those days, we had taken Uzair, Ezra, as son of God. Mm -hmm. And then um, we discussed about how uh, the Christians, uh, they took Jesus as son of God. And what about uh, Nuseris and Malangis um, in Shia faith, uh, Sheikh? Because well, they... I don't, know, I don't know too much about them, to be honest with you. But you, you probably know more about them than me. I don't really know very much about them. Okay. But Nuseris, uh, Sheikh, there is history about them, and they still prevail. Nuseris, what do they believe exactly? Ali Allah. That Ali is God Himself. Oh, oh, those who are oh, those who believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib is uh, is God. Yeah. Yes. So what do you have to say about uh, them and uh, the Malangis uh, are mushrooming, uh, you know, all over um, all over the world now, who have this belief in Ali Allah? Yeah. Unfortunately, there are some parts of. Uh, of the Middle East where this is becoming, uh, and even beyond the Middle East where this is becoming, uh, you know, this belief in the divinity of Ali ibn Abi Talib is, uh, is becoming more common. You know, it reminds me of, of a hadith of the Prophet where he says, Ya Ali, لَوْلَا أَنِّي أَخَافُ أَنْ يَقُولَ فِيكَ مَا قَالَتْ النَّصَارَى فِي الْمَسِيحِ لَقُلْتُ الْيَوْمَ فِيكَ مَقَالَةً لَا تَمُرُّ بِمَلَئٍ مِّنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ إِلَّا أَخَذُ التُّرَابِ مِنْ قَدْنِكَ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, O oh Ali, if it were not for the fear that I have, that people will say about you what the Christians said about Jesus, I would speak about your virtues in such a way that whenever you walk by a group of Muslims, they will take the dust from your feet to seek blessings and barakah. The Prophet ﷺ prophesized, and he almost foreshadows that this will be a problem in the Muslim community, that there will be those who ascribe divinity to Ali ibn Abi Talib because of the many incredible things that he did in his life his many courageous acts and this is why amir al-mu'mineen he says there are two types of people that perish because of me meaning that they are condemned 
محب غال ومبغض قال the one who loves me so excessively that he attributes divinity to me this person is perished he'll be punished and condemned and then you have the one who hates me to such an extent that they despise me amir al-mu'minin alayhi salam is such a polarizing figure that you have those who claim that he's god and then you have those who when he's killed in masjid al-kufa their answer is when they receive the news of the shahad of amir al-mu'minin ali was in a masjid what was he doing in a masjid was ali muslim so you see that in history you see that you have both of these extremes and the way that we respond is that we give the same answer that the quran gives with respect to isa السلام, and maryam they ate they drank they were in need of nourishment amir al-mu'minin used to eat god by definition is needless he is the one who feeds he is not fed ali ibn abi talib was born god is not born ali ibn abi talib died Allah is al hayyu alladhi la yamut. Ali ibn Abi Talib is confined by space and time. Ali ibn Abi Talib prayed. He worshipped in the same way that Imam al Radha asked the Christians, You say that Isa excelled in worship. Who was he worshipping? We say to these people who say Ali ibn Abi Talib is God, Who was Ali doing sujood to when he was hit by Ibn Muljim? To himself? He's prostrating to God. It's very simple. So I will reply to them as the same arguments that the Quran puts forward against the divinity of Jesus Christ. Uh, how would the Imams develop people's taqwa? And do you have any tips or pointers on how we can develop our own? How did the Imams develop the people's the, the, the taqwa of the scholars? Now You know, as you know, of course, every human being has has free will. The Imam السلام, he can only, you know, advise and teach and instruct. And in many cases, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they led by example. You know, the fact that, you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen spent so much time with people like Maytham al -Tammar. Imam al-Sadiq spent a lot of time with, with Zurara and Muhammad ibn Muslim. And the Imams they were, they were the exemplars of taqwa. And this shows you how important it is for us to, to be in the company of righteous people. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, what does he say? By time, man is in loss. All human beings are at loss. But there's an exception. There are only one group of people who will not lose in this game of dunya. Now you would think that the ayah should have stopped there. Those who believe and they do righteous deeds. But Allah says, no, there's something else. And they encourage each other to be truthful. They enjoy truthfulness and they enjoy patience, which means you need encouragement. That this is a collective effort. In the same way, when you go to the gym to exercise, you do better if you have a partner with you. Someone who's encouraging you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is indicating that spirituality is difficult if you're going on this journey by yourself. You need to have friends, companions who, have, who are going on the same journey, who keep each other in check, who advise each other, who admonish each other, who remind each other. When we become healed, someone to remind you to pray Fajr, someone to remind you to pray Salatul Layl, you know, a partner, a spiritual partner. 
وتواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر. It's easier to develop your spirituality when when it's a team effort, as opposed to it being an individual endeavor. Now here's a comment someone wanted to share. For the purposes of better communication in the society we live in, it seems that the question of Jesus being the Son of God could be considered allegorical or literal. And if it's allegorical, then we can talk to them. Uh, most Christians have not thought about this matter, even their leaders. I think to deem it allegorical is not counterintuitive to Islam, and then we can discuss what it means. However, if they mean it literally, then you are dealing with a Christian Wahhabi, so we should not deal with this Son of God thing categorically. Furthermore, it seems Christians deem the Trinity as the God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost would be akin to aspects or attributes of God, kind of akin to the names in Quran. Uh, however, it however, however, categorically that shuts down that shuts down cooperation, cooperation, and this Trinity and stuff, this Trinity stuff, Christian of the Divine I think it's a very good point. I, I think that when we when we interact with our Christian brothers and sisters, it's important for us to present Islam in a way that doesn't make them feel like Islam is so foreign. You know, we actually have a hadith where a hadith that says that creation is the family of God, the metaphorical family of God. And the best one and the most beloved to God is the one who treats his family the best. So even in the Islamic tradition, we have language that is similar to that, that is that our Christian brothers and sisters would appreciate, but we emphasize that this is this is metaphorical. So maybe using this type of language, but is a way to kind of you know bring them closer to the Islamic tradition. But it's always important for us to draw the line and say that these narrations where where God speaks about creation being His family, it's not talking about any a literal relationship or a biological relationship. Rather, it's it's symbolic and it's uh, it's metaphorical. So I think that's a, it's a it's a fair point.